Okay, let's do that. Good morning. <laughs> well, it's great to see that Holy Humor Sunday has left a mark, and I appreciate that. Uh, it is also. It is an honor and a gift to be able to worship and to make a joyful noise unto our Lord. And so let's go ahead and take some time here and go over some, shh, thank you, go over some announcements. Uh, as a reminder, of course, our Wednesday night meal continues this week as well, too. You're welcome to come and be part of that with us. We'd love to have you. Meatloaf. It's meatloaf this week. Uh, so please do come and enjoy that. Uh, Wednesday morning as well, too, the quilters continue to do their work, and if you would like to help, they would love to have you come and be part of that as well, too. I just forgot, whether you're joining us online or in person, thank you. I forgot. We've been having uh, more and more people be able to join us online throughout the weeks, and so I wanted to make sure to, to uh, say good morning to you as well, too. I apologize for that. Uh, and again, we continue to partner with East Dayton Fellowship as well uh, through the Fairview Brethren Food Bank, Brethren Christ. And so if you have items to donate, you can leave them over back here in the narthex. Uh, Sue, make sure they get to where they get to, as well as items to St. Vincent to Paul. Uh, also, camp sign-up is going on right now, too. There are some uh, information sheets that are out in the narthex going into the fellowship hall. You'll see them on your right side there. Take a look. There's a lot of varieties out there. Um, uh, Salem does help cover some of the costs for that as well, too, if you're interested in going. Uh, and Sue happens to be the contact person for that as well, too. So uh, it's, uh, once Easter's done, everybody kind of takes a collective breath trying to, to get their sense of, Okay, what's coming up next? And so as the summer, it gets close. Camp is a great opportunity to interact with people um, and explore faithfully as well, too. So we'd love to see any and all. There's a wide array of options available to you, uh, and you're really encouraged to be a part of that as well, too. Well, uh, those are, I only had a few announcements this morning that I knew of, but let me turn it over to you. Do you have any announcements you would wish to share? Not a chance. love that he asks that. I'm not sure if it's the continued asking or whatever. Don't know. We're going to do two things real quick. I'm going to have you stand up in a moment, but move closer or move closer to one another. Um, in fact, go towards the middle, I would recommend, so that you're near one another. Uh, that I'm, we might be not a lot of people today but by golly, let's be close to one another. So I encourage you, stand up, get up, say good morning, and then move closer to one another. Go ahead, Bonnie. Good morning. Would you please join me in the call to worship? Oh God, sometimes we fail to see your work. The cracks of life seem to attune our eyes and ears, hearts and minds to recognize you. Steer us to respond in ways that further your peace in this world. Lord, in the midst of the sorrow and confusion and exhilaration of the resurrection, the disciples begin to rebuild their lives by starting over. They go back to the thing that they knew, trying to understand what the next step of their lives would be. And in that confusion, that uncertainty, you appear to them and remind them that even in their confusion and weariness for their days and future, your love is the direction their lives are to follow. May we do as the disciples did and trust in your guidance. Amen. 
Our first hymn today is Great is Thy Faithfulness in our blue hymn books, page 327. Will the children please come forward? Well, I certainly am glad you guys are here. Are you okay? Yeah. That surprised you, didn't it? <laughs> it surprised me. You'll hit your head, you bust it open. That's true. That happens sometimes. Hey, do you guys ever, come back. Do you guys ever feel under stress? Oh, you have it all the time. What, what stresses you out? School. Do you ever feel under tre under stress? Here, sit up. Come on. I don't know. Isaac, sit on your butt. Do you ever have to get ready for a test? Do you have spelling? Do you have spelling at your school where you have to take a test and spell the words? I don't know. You don't know? Do you have to learn how to add and subtract? Did you have to learn how to write? 
use clocks? Do you know how to measure things with a, t with a ruler? I never done that. You've never done Well, that's one of the things you're going to learn how to do. After a bit. We will in a little bit. Do you ever have to um, do jumping jacks in gym class? Do you ever have to do something that's stressful in gym class? Do you have to have to run a mile? Okay, calm down. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Come on. <laughs> oh, are you feeling stressed now because I'm asking you questions? Should I direct all my questions to your brother? Hey, Thomas, tell me about something that's very stressful for you. Running the mile in gym. Running a mile in gym. I would agree. That is very stressful. Um, just, Thomas, do you have to study for tests? Whenever I usually don't know something, certainly, I usually try to study it. Uh -huh, you try to study it. Uh -huh. Are there any other things that are stressful to you? In What did you do last weekend that was very stressful? <laughs> you told me. I had a dance class to do for theater. He did a dance class for theater. Well, that was very stressful, wasn't it? Yes. Well... When we're under stress, everyone experiences stress. Okay, I have two objects here. And I put them right here. Can you tell me what they are? Apple and applesauce. Oh, apple and applesauce. And how does the apple turn into applesauce? Do you know? You crush it up and add some sugar to it. Okay. You crush it up, add some sugar. Actually, this is... Andrea Dillon approved applesauce with no added sugar. So there's no sugar in this, but I just want you to know I do have things at my house that have no sugar. It has natural sugar in it from the apples, but, but you have to, did you hear him? It has to crush it up from this state to get it to be applesauce. That takes pressure. And all of us experience pressure all the time. Not only does it have to be crushed up, it has to be cooked, so it has to be under high heat. And the high heat helps it break down so that it is smooth and delicious, and lots of us eat applesauce. It's one of the wonderful things to eat, is applesauce. Now, I have a Bible verse I'm going to read to you, and this comes from James, the first, uh, James 1, 3 and 4. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So while you're under pressure and you're feeling that that is a testing of your faith and of your perseverance, did you persevere all the way through the dance class? I had no other choice but yes. No other choice but yes, he persevered. So now, that's going to give you a bank in, the mi in your mind that, you know, I was under pressure, I stayed with it, I built up the faith in myself that I can do this. So the next time that you are faced with a lot of pressure, you'll think, well, I could do it then. I think I can do it now. And that's what is the pressure is even on with us when we're, when we're just doing things at home, you have to get the chores done. And then, because you get the chores done, and your dad says, hey, that was a great job, again, you have persevered through some pressure, and you have strengthened your faith in yourself, and all the time, God is working with you. So sometimes, when we're under pressure, it is a test of our faith. And God wants us to persevere, to stay with the problem, to overcome the problem, to become better at it, and change and become delicious like applesauce. Not that somebody's going to come up and say, I, you know, I recognize your uh, faith and everything, but God is wanting us to grow in our faith, not just stay the same. If I just let this apple sit on my counter for a long time. Is that fake food? No, that's real. Um, what would happen to this apple? 
it would turn brown, it would shrivel up, and it would become yucky. It would become rotten. And you couldn't eat it then, and it would be useless. And then you have to have another apple or buy another one if that's your last one. That's right. I'll have to buy more. Now, think about my applesauce that has been preserved in this little container. How long do you think I could keep it? Well, with the hungry little pumpkin I have until Charlie sees it, yeah, that's, that's how long. And uh, I have to kind of keep this up. This would last a long time. God wants us to withstand pressures and to grow with him and build our confidence. And that's part of God's plan is it's, life is not going to have is not going to be easy all the time. And there are going to be times when we're under pressure. But all we have to say is, God, thanks for being with me through this hard time. And then God will preserve us and take care of us. I'm glad that God loves you. I'm glad I love you guys too. And we'll go back to Sunday school to find out more. Thank you for coming up. It does. Are you hungry for an apple? Yes. Mm. Because I love apples. Because you love apples. Lord, in the midst of the sorrow and confusion and exhilaration of the resurrection, the disciples begin to rebuild their lives by starting over. And just as a child's creation is given to a parent with love, the worth of the creation is measured in the eye of the parent. Is it a Monet or a Rembrandt creation? No. But does the creation bring joy to the parent's life? Yes. So, so too does our offering bring joy to God. When in its giving, we are seeking one of the ways to show our love to God. Come, sisters and brothers, let us give to show our love of God. Will the ushers please come forward? we give this offering as a declaration and prayer that it will bring joy, hope, love, and peace. These may seem like lofty, perhaps impossible to our minds, but to you, it, it is more than possible. It is a reality. Use this offering as you would use us, O Lord, in any way that you see fit. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our next hymn is Great is the Lord, our blue hymn book, page 87. The scripture reading today is taken from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So, so they did. And there were so many fish, they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they weren't far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. 
Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time. Do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. The reading today is from Here's My Heart. In this fourth resurrection appearance in the Gospel of John, Peter has decided to go back to his day, jo his day job of fishing. At daybreak, Jesus, light of the world, appears to the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. His presence leads to abundant catch of fish. It is in this abundance, in this moment of grace upon grace, John 1, 16, that the disciples recognize Jesus. Coming ashore, they find that Jesus had made breakfast for them, a meal of bread and fish, which would have recalled the abundance of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus recalled the abundance of that. And it comes to his disciples to call them once again to the work of the harvest. With the ref reference to Nathaniel of Cana, we are meant to recognize this scene as a second call narrative for the disciples. A call to do greater works than these, because Jesus will ascend to the Father. It becomes our call story as well. How will we offer witness to the world of the love of God in Jesus after the events of the arrest, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection? How will our testimony sound different on this side of the empty tomb? It is in this context that we need to hear the conversation between Jesus and Peter. There is neither shaming nor blaming, nor does Jesus forgive Peter. Instead, Jesus knows that what we will ask Peter to do is something Peter could not fathom before. Only now, in this renewal of a relationship, where the resurrected Jesus is Peter's trust affirmed and Jesus' trust in Peter confirmed. Jesus needs Peter to be a good shepherd now, to provide pasture to protect the sheep from wolves, thieves, bandits, so that sheep may have abundant life. That's a tall order. But how can God so love the world without us? We are not just called to do living things, but to the, be the very presence of love, the I am in the world where Jesus cannot be, we give our hearts and our whole selves to Jesus so that John 3.16 might really come true. There was... <laughs> I lost my stand. Okay. Oh, that'll work. Okay. Some days... I worry myself. There was a little pass, part of that passage there that Bonnie skipped over, and I was wondering if she would or wouldn't. Um, verse 7 says this. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and jumped into the water. That will make sense in a minute why I just reread that part. Bear with me. Why did they go fishing? Why? We know that in this story, which has so many echoes of things that had already been done, the reading talked about the feeding of the 5,000 with the bread and the fish, which is what Jesus is cooking to feed the disciples. The story has so many memories connected to it. So why did they go fishing? Well, we know fishing was Peter's job. It's what Peter knew to do. It was something he had been taught since he was a young boy, something that he and his brothers had done from such an early age that it was common for them. Apparently, it was so common for them that they would fish naked. Listen, if I'm walking somewhere and I happen upon a little pond or a body of water and there's a naked fisherman in front of me, I'm walking away. That's just me. 
fine. But why is this the action Peter and the other disciples chose to do in this moment of their story, in this period of grief of their story? Not counting the initial resurrection, Jesus has appeared to them two other times prior to this. But then left again. Nothing is making sense to the disciples at this point. Any potential relief from the grief is fleeting at best. Moments where they think, oh, Jesus is here, we'll be fine, it's great. They turn, they look, and Jesus is gone. They can't get a break. Nothing is making sense. So why did they go fishing? I kept coming back to that question again and again because I came up with three different answers. First, he is grieving so much, the disciples are grieving so much, that they want to do something that they don't have to think about it. One of those, those tasks where it's like, I don't have to think, I, just can, I know what to do, I know the motions. And there's evidence to suggest that when people are grieving or when they're uh, truly sorrowful or uh, deep sorrow, movement can help. It's not a fix for everything, and it's not a fix for everyone, but movement, getting up, doing something, just being productive, maybe? I don't know. It does help, even in the short term. There's something to be said about the benefits of moving when grief is pronounced, but be clear, moving doesn't fix everything, and not everyone can muster the emotional strength to drive the physical strength to move. So then maybe he's going back to work. He figured he was out of a job. And bills were going to need to be paid. Those fish don't catch themselves. All right, go back to doing what I was doing. Or maybe he was going to run away. Because remember, he is at risk. He and the other disciples are very much at risk in this space and time. Jesus was their Messiah who was just murdered. He was just arrested, murdered, and then resurrected. It is a very politically sensitive time. And anybody close to Jesus would have likely felt that they were destined for the same outcome. And quickly. So maybe, knowing that they are not in a safe place a safe space or a safe time, they figure out, we've got to go. We've got to go. Well, to go somewhere, you need a little bit of money, don't you? You need to be able to pay to go somewhere. Maybe they were fishing to get a quick buck so they could get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. We don't know why the disciples went fishing. That's one of these stories that exists within Scripture that leaves the answer undefined, unclear, unnamed, because it invites us to put ourselves in the story. Imagine if we were the disciples in that very scary time and place. There are many other possible reasons that they went fishing. And be clear about one other thing. The disciples are grieving. They absolutely are grieving. Grief does not have a timetable. We really wish it would. It does not. This grief that they are feeling is reaching into their souls, their very way of being, and it's transforming them. Because they don't know who they are now. They don't know what they're supposed to do. And this follows 
a time in which they were clear. They were certain. They knew what they were going to do. They were going to be at the right and the left hand of the Messiah when the Messiah came to power. They were going to be the ones who were revered among their communities and their peers because they were the ones who were with Jesus from the beginning. They had a plan. That plan is gone. They knew what their identity was going to be, and now that's gone. They don't know who they are. Their identity is shaken. Don't miss that. We call them disciples because that's how we know them. We know of the story. We know what occurs. But in that time and in that space of experience, they're not sure who they are at that time anymore, what they are or who they will be. They didn't know what to do. And identities matter. It's how humans understand their roles, their expectations, how they navigate themselves through the world. For the disciples, they don't know what to do. Consider for a moment then this this example. I want you to imagine that you are given a job. Doesn't have to be a big job, a little job, whatever job. But you have a job, okay? And you have staked your claim on this job. This is mine. And you do that job over and other, over. And others have jobs similar to yours, and that's fine. That's their job. This is mine. And then one day, just like any other day, you step away from your job for just a minute. Maybe you had to go to the bathroom. Whatever. Maybe you had a phone call. Whatever. And when you come back, your job is gone. The thing that was yours, so is now maybe somebody else is doing that job. Maybe that job just disappeared. All you know is that the thing you did, the thing that was part of your identity, your job, is gone. You can no longer do. How do you react? Are you joyful? Maybe the job was bad. Maybe it wasn't a good job. Maybe it was just a paycheck. And you're like, okay, good. I'll go do anything else. Are you angry that that job is gone? Why would someone take that from you? Were you scared? What will you do now? If I don't have this job, how will I... Hey, my bill, what will I do? Were you nervous of what people would think about you? Ugh. A person can't even get their job right. That person has nothing to do. What might you feel? This, in a very large way, is what the disciples are feeling. This is part of their grief. Not only have they lost somebody they love dearly, but they've also lost their identity, their work. The thing that they were using to help define who they were going to be is now gone. So they're trying to figure out what to do. And in an effort to reclaim something, they go fishing. Peter goes to fish. And and it's one of those lines as well, too. It's amazing to me to ask, how do you hear it? When Peter says he's going to go fishing, how do you hear it? Do you hear Peter standing up boldly? Gentlemen, I'm going fishing. Or do you hear it as a One of 11 just sitting there looking at their feet, unsure of what to do. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. How do you hear that? And others go with them. 
Why? We're not told why. Because the why is meant for us to ask ourselves that question too. All we know for sure is that a group of men, unsure of what the future holds, unclear of what they're doing, who they are, and what they're going to do in the future, are fishing. And it's not going well. Oh, good. They're bad at this now, too. Verse 3 says, they caught nothing. Oh, man. I guess, you know, you teach a man to ride a bike, you can ride it forever. But I guess a man forgets how to fish after three years. And in the morning, they hear a voice asking if they've caught anything to eat because fishing was done primarily at night for a multitude of reasons. And so imagine you're grieving. You went back to do something. You can't even do that right, apparently. And then somebody from the shore asks, did you catch anything? Again, how do you hear that question? Hey, did you guys catch anything? Did you guys catch anything? Did you guys catch anything? How do you hear that question? Because that, how you hear it, how you hear it being asked is a reflection partly of what you need, what you feel, where you are in this story as well too. And while I don't hear mocking in this question from Jesus on the shore, I do hear a little sting to it. For if they were wanting to go back to doing something they knew, the disciples were certain they could go back and do fishing. Because a lot of them had been doing it for so long. And they go back to it and they quite literally catch nothing. But the expectation was from people in that time, if you wanted fish, just go down to the shore. There's going to be people there who caught fish. They have a customer. But they've caught nothing. And if they were looking to make a quick buck, if the disciples were trying to flee, get out of Dodge as quickly as they possibly could, the plan was catch some fish, sell it to somebody, and get out. Well, there's somebody who's willing to buy, apparently. But they didn't catch any fish. Still, the question looms, and the answer is, it's empty. Cast your net on the other side. It's not a quick snap. It's a, wait a minute. I've heard this before. This, this line, this direction to cast again when all the work has been done and nothing has been resolved. This sounds familiar. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Luke chapter 5, the call story of Peter. So they do. And guess what? Yep, fish. So many fish. So many fish that Peter, suddenly ashamed of being naked, again, what is with naked fishing? I don't understand. Wouldn't you get sunburned? I don't know. Mosquitoes? Just, you know. Peter abandons the other disciples. They probably could have used the help, frankly. And goes to the shore. And when the disciples later catch up with their ample catch, they find Jesus cooking breakfast and asks for some more. And here is where something quite interesting happens. <clears throat> Remember, the disciples were identityless. They were grieving. Their Messiah had been murdered, then resurrected, then appeared to them and vanished as well. They don't know what to think. They are watching and waiting and <clears throat> hungry. They worked all night. They are hungry. A few years ago, I learned a very important lesson with my boys. 
Don't talk to them until they get something in their bellies. After school, don't talk to them. Hi, how are you? Good, great. Eat a snack, then we'll talk. Before the disciples can do anything, they must eat. That is a basic human thing. The book of James will put it this way later on. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? James 2, verse 6. If you want to see change, you got to feed. you got to feed them. That's how it is. Jesus seems to get this. And so before, <coughs> before any teaching, before any, any reassurance of self, of identity, anything Jesus does to, to help the disciples feel at ease about what is happening, he feeds them. Nothing changes until people are fed. Consider that the next time you see somebody hungry and asking for money. But Jesus, after feeding the disciples, asked Peter, do you love me? What a question to ask. And why would Jesus ask it? When I do premarital counseling with couples, I use a book that's been out for a very long time uh, called The Five Love Languages. It's a book that many people have read. It's kind of in the, it's been out long enough that a lot of people when you say five love languages, inevitably somebody goes, I've heard that or I've read that or something along those lines. And, and the idea behind it is if you love your spouse, you, you try to show it. If you love somebody close to you, you try to show it in a way that they feel it. So you've got to figure out how they hear love, how they experience love. The book suggests there's five ways. There's words of affirmation, acts of service, gift giving, uh, quality time, and physical touch. Ashley was quality time, just being together. For me, it was acts of service. The idea is how do you show love in a way that somebody hears it, that somebody feels it. Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? For Jesus, it's not just the declaration of the words that matter, but the actual tending and caring for. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. This is how the love Peter has for Jesus will be shown. Others will be taken care of. To quote our reading this morning, which came from the Lenten devotion that we use throughout Lent. Quote, that's a tall order. But how can God so love the world without us? We are not just called to do living things, but to be the very presence of love, the I am in the world when Jesus cannot be. Jesus is giving this teaching to a people who can barely believe that Jesus is in front of them. Surely in their minds as they begin to trust that Jesus is actually the one there, it's likely their brains are going, okay, good, we can go back to the way it was two weeks ago before you were murdered. Let's go back and do that again. We were doing pretty well with that, Jesus. Let's go back to the way it was. You can't. You cannot unring a bell. Once a moment has happened, it has happened. It cannot be recovered. They are so desperate for an identity. They are so desperate to be, to know who they are and who they're going to be. And they are scared. This probably starts to sound familiar. Because remember, the questions of stories in, in the Bible are meant for us to put ourselves into them as well, too. To ask of ourselves, what would I feel if I were there? It's quite likely they were afraid. And so, yes, 
Loving as Jesus loved, caring for the sheep and the lambs of God is a tall order. And it is also an order that we have been on the other end of. Someone somewhere has shown us the love of Jesus. Now we are asked to share that with others. Quote, Jesus needs Peter to be the, shep- the good shepherd now, to provide pasture, to protect the sheep from wolves, thieves, and bandits, so that the sheep might have abundant life. This command is given to a few people in a very large open space. And they are uncertain of what their future is going to be. That's who Jesus is talking to. And because of that moment, and so many other faithful moments, we are asked to do the same. Let us consider. Where can we cast our nets that we haven't been able to before? Where can we reach out, maybe in ways we weren't expecting and thought we could never do? Who can we care for that maybe we couldn't care for before? How can we show the love of Jesus even when we are scared, nervous, and uncertain? Those are great questions. Let's find out. Amen. Jesus calls Peter to be a shepherd when Peter does not think it can be done. Peter is focused on what can't happen. Jesus is focused on what can happen. And what can happen when people are cared for is as majestic as it is breathtaking. When we show care for others and others show care for us, then truly God's love is alive. So come, sisters and brothers. And let us show care to the joys and concerns of our sisters and brothers. After a prayer is shared, I invite you to enter into a time of silence for what you have heard. And when you hear me say, O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, I invite you then to raise your head, to raise your head and hearts to hear and to share with one another again. What joys and concerns do we bring to share this morning? I saw Mr. Malott was here for for time with us this morning, uh, so it's good to see that he broke out of Brookhaven um, uh, as well. So we celebrate his continued uh, recovery. and just Diana Haynes, of course, as far as I know, um, is still recovering uh, as well, too. And while she is improving, I haven't heard an update yet, but I know that the prayers uh, would be well received as well, too. O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. What else do we bring? I would say a joy would be that we had about 20, I think about 23 women here yesterday for the retreat and it was just fantastic and we had a great time and uh, also Wanda was supposed to have um, I think a, a conference on Thursday so but I haven't heard from her yet in Iowa I think is Wanda King no this is Wanda Shade, oh, Shade there was okay. supposed to be a conference about her care on Thursday so but I haven't heard from her so I'm not okay. sure what the results were okay thank you
O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. Are there, any, are there any other joys or concerns we would wish to share this morning? Yeah. Yep, safe travels from Wanda King as she returns tomorrow or today, one of the two, uh, from a workshop she was leading for child um, disaster services, of which she is a part of, so. O oh Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. Uh, an update as well, too. Drew Shower, who you received a couple of prayer updates for throughout the week, is improving and is doing better. Um, so we celebrate the fact that uh, his journey has taken a few steps uh, towards healing uh, in the midst of what will probably be a very long journey. So we celebrate the steps that have been made. O oh Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. Is there anything else we'd wish to share this morning? Join with me in prayer. Lord, we know that there is much in this world that seems insurmountable, unjust, unfair, impossible. We have anger, pains, sufferings, physical pain, emotional agony, hatred, violence, and greed all around and sometimes within us. When those feelings are there and present, we feel as though an anchor is pulling us down and holding us back. Lord, help us to trust and to share the sorrows that we carry so they are not what define us, but our experiences and opportunities that open us up to others. For when we are open and trusting and supporting of one another, then truly, truly, truly we are joyous. And we celebrate the joys, the healings, the wisdoms, the experiences, the laughter, the peace that is experienced. Lord, guide us in our lives so that we can be the people who feed your sheep. Help us to live our lives so that your love is shown. Guide us to live our lives based on the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and join in our final hymn this morning, hymn number 322, for we are strangers no more found in the blue hymnal.
So go now, sisters and brothers, and provide pasture to protect the sheep from the wolves, thieves, and bandits, so that the sheep may have abundant life. Go now and be peace. Amen.